Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Jennifer Larson, and I am the training coordinator for the Office of Community Living. We'll just go through a quick uh, housekeeping update today. We are recording today's meeting, and we'll make that available in the coming days of, on our website. We will be using the Q&A panel to manage questions. So please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to type those in as you have them. The chat will only be used to share links with you. We will not be responding to questions there. A copy of today's slides are available on our website as well, and we will add a link to those in the chat for you. And Zoom does provide closed captioning. If you click on the CC button at the bottom of your screen, you can either turn that on or off. And with that, I will turn it over to Bonnie to start the presentation. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Jen, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Jen, I will let you know that the Zoom won't let me share my video, so maybe if you or Max could fix that while I go ahead and kick us off and get us started, that would be great. Um, welcome to the Office of Community Living Winter Webinar Update. Uh, I really appreciate each of you uh, choosing to spend your uh, morning with us. Uh, you know, the goal of these webinars, I think we've moved to twice a year just to create space to have time to update with our, to touch base with our community-based partners on the work that is underway within the Office of Community Living in a more holistic way, so 70,000 foot view, if you will, um, looking at um, all of the work that we have cross office. We know that many of you are deeply engaged on individual levels, if you will, um, in, in specific projects. Uh, but today we will take a, a, a bigger view and then dive deeper on some key issues that are, um, I think, pressing for many of us at this time. Ah! There you go. There's my video. Hi, everyone. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and dive right in. If you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so here's our agenda for today. So I'm going to spend some time up front just reviewing um, our key goals for this year. And, you know, what is it that uh, my team and I are, are steadfast uh, in implementing uh, in the 2024 calendar year? Um, Amanda and Yasmin will be joining me for some case management updates. Uh, clearly, uh, that is a key priority for our system right now. Um, and then I will talk about our public health emergency work um, as that pertains to our long-term services and supports providers. Um, I will also uh, highlight some key uh, key announcements around Money Follows the Person, a federal grant, um, and give a brief overview of our budget and legislative priorities now that they're all public. Um, I know some of you are, are nerdy enough to listen in on our joint budget committee here hearings. I'm hoping that most of you are not. So I will give just a, a, a very, again, 70,000 foot view over um, out of all of healthcare policy and financing, what within those budget requests are specific to the Office of Community Living. Um, and then we will round out our presentation today with some grant opportunities um, that we hope that, that you uh, might take advantage of. So with that, let's go ahead and dive right in. Can we go to the next slide, please? All right, next slide. All right, um, so let's start our current uh, primary office goals. Um, you can see here on this slide that we are focused on five goals within the Office of Community Living. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, we are uh, perhaps uh, uh, really good at uh, taking what are probably um, 10 goals and calling them one. Um, so if you're feeling like there's just an extraordinary amount of things happening in the system, I want to validate that for you because there are <laughs> Um, so first on our list, of course, is um, the American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA project implementation. And so for Colorado, uh, that is comprised of 63 projects that, you know, we have this very truncated timeline uh, to leverage that once in a lifetime funding to really strengthen, enhance uh, and expand our home and community based service system. And, and we are uh, uh, really intentional on not wasting that once in a life 
time opportunity. So um, we are working hard to make sure that our, our spending and our projects remain on track and that we're leveraging those those uh, federal dollars. Uh, next up, we have the goal of strengthening our community-based uh, uh, transitions. And the goal here really is to make sure that our long-term services and support system really has the infrastructure to both support people who are living in an institutional setting to transition back to the community if that is their desire and that is their preference, uh, but also to mitigate institutional placement to begin with. Um, so we have an entire work stream around that. Um, next up, and we've had this goal for several years now um, because it's a big one, it's an important one, and I imagine it will remain on our list for, for a few years to come, is to address the critical staffing shortages uh, within the long-term care space. And, um, you know, for us, that is uh, looking at wage sustainability, uh, making sure that we have portable training opportunities, um, and the implementation of new technologies. And we're looking at how we make sure that um, both we stabilize the long-term care work Workforce, but also strengthen it for our future needs. Um, and then, of course, we have the umbrella goal of implement case management redesign, um, which, you know, means uh, federal compliance, uh, but it also means increasing quality in our case management system, uh, simplifying what we know is really a complex system, um, and making sure that we have accountability so that, um, you know, members, their families, providers know what to expect and can have some uh, quality quality of service across the state of Colorado. And then finally, last but not least, we are looking to transform the nursing home industry to ensure sustainability, um, you know, coming out of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that particular provider type was perhaps impacted more than any other. And looking at how we can learn from um, some what were some pretty difficult lessons um, and look at what are the needs of our community to say, how do we take that service type and make sure that, that we are being responsive to the community moving forward, um, that we have learned lessons that we needed to, and that we have a sustainable and quality uh, service delivery option moving forward. So uh, we have no shortage of worthy problems to solve, and we thank you in your partnership in that as we move forward. Um, I am going to quickly check the, the chat just to see if there is you know, any questions from the community uh, on any of these goals before I keep us moving. I don't see any, so I'm going to move us along and actually hand it over to Amanda, who is going to kick us off with uh, a case management uh, updates. Amanda, are you on and are you ready? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, first all of all, if you don't know me, um, I did live in Alaska for 14 years, and this last week has really felt a little reminiscent of that Arctic freeze that I experienced up there. So I do hope you all are staying warm, and for those of you that are feeling the warm-up um, that we had the last couple of days and we'll have this weekend are enjoying that. So there's a lot going on with case management, um, particularly we are really focusing on our new implementation of our care and case management system, as well as um, transitioning members with our redesign efforts. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, this roadmap is familiar to those of you um, that have participated in these webinars, but for those of you that haven't, this is really a slide to show um, we have as a framework, the foundation of our case management redesign is really predicated on a number of IT infrastructure um, and, and that predicates then our goals around implementing a person-centered budget algorithm, a new single Colorado assessment that brings together a number of tools that have historically been used um, for determining eligibility and level of care um, and creating a new person-centered support plan. So on this slide, you'll see that there are two major updates um, in terms of where we're at with the timeline. Uh, we implemented our new care and case management IT system on July 5th of this of last summer, I guess. Um, and then we, based on the implementation of that, um, recognized we needed to ensure there was more system stabilization and have not implemented our new assessment tool. Um, you'll see in phase three, we push that out to the summertime. Um, and once we have a, a final date there, we will communicate that out to the larger group. 
Um, but we are still going to continue with our implementation of the streamlined eligibility, just using our existing um, level of care, or some of you may know it as the 100.2. Um, and that will allow information to flow from our care and case management system to the county CBMS eligibility system and eliminate the need for a lot of paper processing back and forth between case management agencies and counties. So Bonnie will also talk a little bit more about streamline eligibility in a later slide. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, the department just wants to um, recognize that there was a convergence of a number of monumental changes um, within our case management um, ecosystem, as well as the, the overall long-term care community. Um, with our new CCM implementation and the public health emergency unwind and redesign, which really is making us continuously reevaluate um, and look at these timelines. Our big goal at, that you'll see at the end of this road is our person-centered budget algorithm and our community first choice um, implementation. And, you know, for the person-centered budget algorithm, we really do need to be using the new Colorado single assessment so that we can use the data um, to really determine which variables will help us um, in making that person-centered budget um, algorithm, which will be implemented with the CFC. So we will have a stakeholder engagement um, and continue stakeholder engagement around that effort. We have been on pause um, with the person-centered budget algorithm because we cannot develop that until we are implementing the new single assessment. So um, if we could go to the next slide, I'll give some more updates on the care and case management system. Um, so again, as I mentioned in the last slide, to fully implement um, that foundation of a lot of our, our changes and our goals and priorities within OCL, um, we need this new modern IT system that has the infrastructure that will support the innovation and the changes in the system. Um, when we launched that system in July of 2023, our goal is really to streamline members' experience, providers, and the workload that the case managers have, um, including consolidating a number of legacy systems that are current that historically had been used. Um, you know, the launch of our new care and case management system um, has not been without challenges. Um, this system replaced the the previous system called the benefit utilization and the DD web. Um, case managers are still using the bridge, um, but the care and case management system is integrated um, with the bridge, which is the, the pathway to the interchange or the Medicaid information system, and then our CBMS, which is our financial eligibility system. And so this allows for uh, more time, um, it reduces the time consuming data checking across multiple systems. When we implemented the new system, the department had to find strategies for expected and anticipated issues that we thought would present themselves at the launch um, and had provided and communicated workarounds and strategies to help mitigate these impacts. However, with every system launch um, being different, there were unexpected problems that occurred and the department is continuing to work with the vendors and case managers and stakeholders to identify, resolve and communicate resolutions as necessary. These efforts will continue until the system is fully stabilized and we continue to make updates and enhancements to the system to improve the user experience. Um, the department does have a dedicated web page um, for the care and case management system where known issues and other information can be obtained. We also um, in December put out a update and news more of a newsletter type update out to community, broader community stakeholder group, and that will be a monthly going forward. Um, so you, after this webinar, can anticipate that that will be sent out again. So we're trying to make sure that we're keeping everyone informed on the different um, efforts and the work around the care and case management system, because we know that there is it does impact the larger community. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, and when we talk about some of the issues that we um, encountered with the launch, you know, for large systems, having a high performing call center is one of the critical pieces um, to not only assist end users in navigating the new system, but it's also the central clearinghouse for identifying issues that are experienced by users so that they can be reported to the project team to do a root cause analysis, identify a solution, and then implement the fix. 
Um, in November, we transitioned to a new vendor to perform this responsibility um, and have seen much improved results um, in, in this new vendor. Um, another one of the large drivers to the challenges that case management agencies in the department have been working through is a result of the data migration. Um, when you have legacy systems that were in effect for over 20 years, you can imagine the millions of data points and records that had to be transferred from the legacy systems into the new care and case management system. All of those fields between the legacy systems and the CCM were mapped. Um, and if there was an error in that mapping or if the legacy data had errors, it has the negative impact on the CCM and the usability for the CCM. So, and the, use, the end users of the CCM. So, so we are working with the vendors and our community partners um, to really work through and resolve um, the data migration challenges to mitigate some of the report challenges. Um, we've created new uh, reports for the case management agencies to use, as well as providing one-on-one -on -one assistance and pulling reports on their behalf to help assist them navigate um, what they use the reports for. Um, so again, we are continuing to look at um, system enhancements and other training opportunities based on the feedback we've received from the users to improve the system. If we can go to the next slide. Case management redesign. Um, the department has been working for years to develop and plan um, case management redesign, as Bonnie mentioned, to really streamline and simplify case management statewide to increase quality and consistency as well as accountability um, and, and also come into compliance with the federal conflict-free case management requirements. Um, we began transitioning um, into the, um, the members uh, across the state um, in November, and we have three cohorts of transitions the first being November 1st, that was completed. We have a second one coming up March 1st of 2024. And the third and final phase for transitions will occur on July 1st of 2024. The department and the transitioning agencies experienced a learning curve with the first transition in November, as this was the first time the member data was integrated with our um, CBMS, which is our financial eligibility system. And we were managing transitions with data from the new CCM. As such, we continue to refine our data and analytics and transition processes as we look to phase two, which is March 1st, and then our final phase in July. So for example, uh, zip codes are split across counties um, or even zip codes within the same county um, may not result in um, needing to transition. However, the way the data was pulled, we did transition some members who um, from one case management agency to another um, that should not have been transitioned. So we are working closely with the case management agencies and members um, to address any of the outstanding issues that were a direct result of the data migration um, and the transition. If we can go to the next slide. Um, one of the other pieces here is we have on July 1st, we are planning for all of the case management agencies that were performing work under what we have historically called pri private case management agencies. They will all be in that third phase of transitions um, for July 1st, just to ensure that we minimize multiple transitions or um, have a more smooth and um, effective transition. All of these agencies will transition to the case management agencies that were awarded the contracts for their defined service areas. So all members across the long-term care community care continuum um, in Colorado's 64 counties will be served by a total of 15 agencies across the 20 defined service areas. Um, it looks like Max is already ahead of me, but um, you'll see on the left on your screen, there is a map. It is an interactive map that will show by county which case management agency um, serves that area. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, huge thank you um, and shout out to everyone who was really involved with case management redesign rule revisions. To implement all of the changes related to case management redesign, we needed to restructure the rules. Um, this was a Herculean undertaking as we have a lot of rules, as many of you know, 
Um, and there's a lot of duplication and there was a lot of interweaving between case management and provider rules and member responsibilities and case manager responsibilities. And so the department put forward rule revision that restructured it to, to eliminate the duplications and redundancies and really clarify um, overarching roles and responsibilities. Many of you participated in this, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we couldn't do this work without your collaboration and partnership and all of the feedback that you provided. Um, this has been a significant effort, um, and the team had their first reading at the Medical Service Board in December, and the second reading was last Friday, January 12th, which passed the final adoption. So the rules will be effective March 16th. The next step in this process, we will be repealing the rules that were specific to single entry points and community center boards since um, because those will now be in the case management agency rules um, and this full implementation. Um, the goal is with July 1st with the full um, transition being complete. There will be a number of activities this spring and fall. Uh, for those rule revisions that will go through the stakeholder process, um, as well as the public hearings for um, the MSB board. I want to acknowledge that we know there is still work to do um, on other areas of the rules, and we'll continue to do stakeholder engagement um, on those rules specifically as we move forward. But this overarching Herculean effort really gives us that framework to do it. So again, I just want to say thank you. Um, we had hundreds and hundreds of comments and feedback, and it really is a testament to the support we have um, and collaboration with all of our community partners. Um, the other piece and the one of the last things I have is just we know that um, there is a lot of changes happening and there's a lot of challenges within the case management ecosystem currently. And so our goal is to leverage the ARPA funding to be able to provide support to case management agencies for unexpected costs related to the implementation of the new care and case management system, as well as transitions so that they can have resources to assist um, and, and really improve uh, member experience. Uh, this grant is meant to help support these extra efforts um, that the case management agencies have taken on um, that are also attributed to case management redesign, the public health and emergency unwind, as well as the care and case management system. So before I open it up for comments, I do just want to say that a lot of updates, there's a lot going on. Um, first and foremost, all day long, our goal around any of our changes, whether it's implementing the care and case management system, transitions, or programmatic changes, the members are always first. Um, and our goal is always to minimize impact to members and the disruption to their services. Um, and I know that uh, members have been impacted by these changes the last several months. And for that, we're really sorry. Um, you know, one member is too many members. And we have a dedicated team that will continue working directly with case management agencies um, to resolve issues and escalations so that we can ensure that there is minimal impact to member services. So. Thank you, everyone. And with that, Bonnie, I will turn it back to you. Great. Thanks, Amanda. If we can't can everyone hear me? Hello. Yeah, thanks. Hear you, Bonnie. Great. If you can go to the next slide. It's uh, interesting how like instantaneously we want everything to happen, right? <laughs> Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, I saw that there was a question in the chat. I'm sure the team is working on responding to that. So I'm just gonna keep us moving along if that's all right with everyone on the call. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, I think I have a, a hodgepodge, if you will, of sort of some key updates. Um, so in planning for this webinar, uh, we knew that it would be really important to talk about the public health emergency unwind. Um, and specifically, its impact on long-term care providers. Um, we know that, you know, uh, people uh, who receive long-term services and supports have lost eligibility. Um, that certainly has had an impact on them, and it has certainly had an impact on the providers that serve them. Um, and uh, we actually have our... our our partners within healthcare policy and financing that are leading the unwind efforts uh, and our eligibility and policy offices are 
um, hosting their own partner webinar on the PHE Unwind uh, on the 24th. Um, and in that webinar, they're going to be discussing uh, what does our data show, uh, what are our current outreach strategies, um, how are they collecting feedback, they're going to want to hear feedback in that webinar. So um, if I can get a member of my team to drop the registration link into the chat, um, we think that instead of uh, bifurcating the information, if that is something that is near and dear to you, I would encourage you to register for that webinar and, and directly uh, participate and provide your feedback to them as they are navigating the unwind efforts. Um, but I do have um, some key strategies that I want to share that we have partnered with them on and put in place specifically for the long-term care community. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, thank you for that, Max. I um, want to remind you all that we have put in place a uh, escalation process. So if you are a member, uh, if you're a family member, if you're a provider, and you have somebody who has lost long-term care eligibility, um, and you have done your due diligence to work with the county or work with the case management agency, and um, you cannot get the progress that's necessary to make sure that their services remain in place, uh, we please ask you to fill out this escalation form so at a state level, um, we can then intervene and work with, you know, the counties and case management agencies to make sure that that safety net remains in place and that people continue to receive services. Um, the escalation form is, is, I think, pretty important for us. And again, if I can thank you, Max, put that in the chat. Very much appreciate it. Um, the forms are really important. The forms with <laughs> the forms, the fields within the forms Oh, I'll say that three times, it's like a tongue twister, um, are really important because they are what are needed for us to problem solve. So if you are filling out that form, I, I ask you kindly to make sure every field is complete so that we can be as expeditious as possible uh, and providing some remediation for, I'm guessing if you're escalating, you've done some work, you're already frustrated, some quick resolution is really what is needed. So um, we do have that process. I ask that, you know, use some discernment around if and when you're escalating. If we escalate everything, then that process becomes diffused and the resources that we have dedicated towards it um, also become diffused. So we really want to use it for, uh, hey, we followed the process, we did what we needed to, and we're not getting the traction we needed. Um, and then absolutely, won't, we want to intervene at a state level. Um, also, I want to take this as an opportunity to highlight some key changes that are, uh, I think, upcoming, uh, not necessarily related to the PHE Unwind, but I think that will alleviate some of the stress and burden related to long-term care eligibility. Uh, so one of the things that has been in the works for some time now is the streamlined eligibility implementation. Uh, so for those of you that are maybe not near and dear to the eligibility process, um, you know, one of the things that causes, uh, I think, hiccups and the eligibility process for people with long-term care is in Colorado, we have so many different programs. And if a person is incorrectly coded, um, is maybe say being enrolled in the EBD waiver, when in fact they're enrolled in say the SLS waiver, um, that causes obviously downstream impacts and providers can't bill and the person can't enroll. And so what the streamlined eligibility will do is that person will be enrolled in long-term care. It'll sort of mitigate that program by program hiccup that happens on the front end. Um, so we're really excited that after a lot of work that we'll be looking at uh, implementing that in February. And we think that, you know, when we look at all of the bottlenecks that happen within our system, that'll sort of um, alleviate some of the bottlenecks that are happening, I think, um, that have been longstanding and really help us make sure that we're expediting that enrollment process wherever we can. Um, and I think secondarily, we are also looking at um, having peak pro access for case managers. Um, so giving, um, you know, case managers in the long-term care side, just, you know, real timeline aside in terms of what is happening from the financial eligibility side of the shop. Um, and so we think this is really important, just in again, being able to provide holistic wraparound care. And we know eligibility in and of itself uh, is perhaps the biggest pain point when we're looking at just getting somebody access to services, looking at how complex it can be. So um, as painful as it might be right now, I'm, I am uh, perhaps cautiously hopeful that this slide uh, inspires you for a brighter future. I know it does for me as well. 
Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, in that same vein, we've also heard from providers that, you know, the eligibility hiccup, hiccups related to, uh, in some cases, the PHE unwind, in other cases related to this, the case management agency transitions has, result, has resulted in, um, you know, people who should be eligible for long-term care, losing eligibility, providers uh, rendering services, not being able to get paid. Um, and of course, you know, providers are such an important part of our ecosystem. We want to make sure that we're not doing anything to jeopardize that. Um, so we want to be clear, we have sent out previous communication about this. I'm not showing up at a webinar saying you have until tomorrow um, or uh, at 5 p.m. to do a thing. But I do want to remind you all that the deadline to apply for provisional provider payments is tomorrow at 5 p.m. Mountain Time. Um, and these provisional provider payments are, you know, based off what was you know, previously build. There's a bunch of parameters in place, but um, it is a way for us to go ahead and issue some payments while the eligibility components are being worked out um, and make sure that providers are not having to hold uh, that AR balance uh, in the interim. Uh, we want to make sure that people continue to receive services. We want to make sure that providers are not in a financial bad way. Um, and we're hoping that this is a uh, short-term solution uh, while we work on those medium-term, um, uh, you know, longer-term solutions uh, that will help everyone. Um, it looks like Max also put a link in the chat. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you can sort of go to our provider resource page and find out more. Uh, next slide, please. Um, want to, uh, because we're only doing this twice a year, so this feels antiquated, but uh, this is pretty exciting stuff. Uh, I want to announce that Colorado was awarded a new Money Follows the Person demonstration grant this past fall. Uh, for those of you that have been around for a while, um, we previously had a Money Follows the Demonstration grant, and our federal partner said, it's going away. You have to figure out how to codify it in your system. Colorado was the first state in the nation to codify that through legislation in 2017. And then they said, just kidding. It hasn't gone away. Uh, so we were sort of thankful, right? Like we had figured it out. We had codified the services that we wanted to move forward from the previous demonstration grant. And I apologize for those of you that might not be familiar. Uh, Money Follows the Person is a federal grant program really aimed at, you know, helping people move out of institutional settings um, and back into the community. Um, and so it offers, you know, federal funding to help states develop the infrastructure to do that uh, and funding to, to just support services to do that. So um, a really cool opportunity. Uh, they then announced this past year 100% federal funding for some key services, and the opportunity was really too good for us to pass up. So we went ahead and put our, our name in the hat, if you will, and are, are quite proud that we were awarded that grant. Um, so we had put together some budget requests last year aimed at helping us improve these components of our long-term care system. And so this Money Follows the Person demonstration grant really just builds on that using 100% federal dollars. Um, so some of the key things that are included is we will have pre-tenancy support, uh, so aimed at helping people understand what their rights are as a tenant, uh, rental assistance, if you will, down payment assistance to, to find a place. I mean, some of the barriers to, as you might imagine, in terms of moving out of an institutional setting, say maybe even your own apartment, is just having the funding to do that. Um, it also will help with pre-transition home modifications, right? So the challenge is CMS won't pay for home modifications unless somebody's enrolled in a, an HCBS waiver. And of course, you can't be enrolled in an HCBS waiver if you're in a nursing facility, for example. So this gives us some in-between ways to, if somebody needs a modification to their home to move out, that we can pay for that and do that. Um, it also provides funding for peer mentorship. Um, sometimes you might think that you're not capable of doing something until you see somebody who has such a similar circumstance as you who also did that thing. So peer mentorship uh, can be a, an important component of successful transition, and we're excited to fund that with this new grant. Um, we also have a, a capacity building grant available for transition coordination agencies specifically. So my TCAs, if you're on the 
the webinar, I invite you to apply for those grants to build capacity within your programs. I think the application grant was dropped in the chat and the deadline for that is February 9th. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so I'm gonna do that 70,000 foot view of the Office of Community Living, Living budget and legislative priorities uh, now that they are live and no longer private. Um, so of course, first and foremost, uh, we uh, requested funding for um, uh, enrolling people from the development disability uh, waiver waiting list. Um, we have continued to prioritize enrollment into that waiver uh, for you know people who meet what's called reserve capacity criteria, which encompasses a whole host of things. Uh, it's emergency criteria, it's aging uh, caregivers, it's uh, kids transitioning from uh, high need waivers, uh, making sure that there's no gaps in care, foster care. Uh, so I think it's very important that we continue to make sure that um, while we may not have the funding to enroll everyone on that waiting list, that nobody is in crisis and those reserve capacity uh, enrollments ensure that. Uh, next up, we have our provider rate request. So this uh, R6 request included funding for a 1% across the board uh, rate increase and then targeted adjustments, which included uh, rebasing our single assessment tool. So as we are looking to our future to implement our new assessment tool, we knew it would cost money, but we didn't know how much money until we actually implemented it. So this this budget request will give us money to do that. Um, it also includes a request for a regional center transition rate. So if you're not sensing a theme of institutional to community-based, like we are really, I think, continue to be focused on making sure we have a system that supports that. So um, making sure that we are having a higher rate as people are coming out of regional centers into community to ensure stabilization and sort of bolstered staffing to support that uh, for a period of time. Um, it also includes increasing uh, the rate for HCBS waiver services to reflect that higher base wage requirement uh, for workers, both statewide and in Denver. Um, and that is um, in direct correlation to sort of minimum wage increases and how do we keep pace and make sure that providers, uh, that we have a rate that supports that. Um, in terms of our R9 request, this includes funding for to continue our pain management centers of excellence. Uh, this is important because this uh, was an ARPA project uh, that was really aimed at how do we make sure people with disabilities are included in this pain management center and that they have a competency to serve people with you know some uh, multiple chronic conditions um, who really need that pain management support. And then R10 is funding to establish a third party utilization review, utilization management assessor for private duty nursing, long term home health, um, and HMA benefits. So we have some uniformity uh, around how those benefits are assessed and authorized. Next slide, please. For 11, uh, these uh, really are aimed at looking at funding um, uh, uh, initiatives that were previously funded under uh, the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, so uh, systems changes that will be needed to enhance our care and case management system um, for the new community first choice implementation, um, for the long-term home health private duty nursing, acuity tool that we're looking at implementing, um, provider oversight, and then we have this like member-facing provider search tool that we're looking at implementing. So this is long-term, how do we sustain that? Uh, so some funding there. Um, it provides some additional funding for our person-centered budget algorithm. Um, and then, of course, we have invested a ton of money into our direct care workforce initiatives, and then we're requesting a small amount of money to sort of sustain those initiatives ongoing. I don't think anybody would disagree that the direct care workforce crisis is likely not going away anytime soon. Um, and then R14 is just a contract true up. We work with um, our sister state agency to do host home inspections and that as the number of host home inspections have grown, we just have to make sure that we can pay for it. Um, next slide, please. All right. Uh, and then next up, I am going to pass it over to Max Winkler, who's going to talk about some grant opportunities. Max? Thank you, Bonnie. 
Hi, everybody. Uh, as Bonnie said, I'm Max Winkler. I am the Strategic Unit Supervisor within the Office of Community Living, and I'm going to share some information about some grant opportunities that are still open for applications through the American Rescue Plan Act funding that we have. So next slide. Okay, the first is our member emergency preparedness grants. Um, these are direct uh, opportunities for Medicaid members to obtain some pretty neat uh, tools to add to their toolkits at home. Um, this first one is our battery backup power supply system application. Um, a battery backup power supply system is a device that uses batteries um, and can provide power to homes when there's a power outage or if there's an emergency evacuation, say, this doesn't only apply to power outages, but things like wildfires, for example, in Colorado, which unfortunately are becoming more prevalent. And if an individual has a piece of life-sustaining equipment that they need to have with them and ensure that they have access to that requires power, they can use these backup batteries to um, really uh, kind of ride out a, a prolonged period where they can power those devices. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I can outline some of the eligibility criteria. So to qualify, uh, members must be active within Medicaid and they must use a life piece of life sustaining equipment. And that is more broad um, than you might think. It includes things like chair lifts or power wheelchairs, CPAP machines, but it can also include things um, you know, like a mini, mini refrigerator that's used to keep medications that they're prescribed chilled, for example. Um, so there's a, a link here on the screen on the slide that I'll drop into the chat that allows you to look through more examples of items that are covered under that life sustaining equipment criteria. The application is also linked on this slide, which I will do my best to drop into the chat after I'm done presenting. Um, we're partnering with the University of Colorado Center for Inclusive Design and Engineering on this project. Some of you might know them as assistive technology partners in the past. They are a fantastic partner in this and have a ton of knowledge. They did a lot of really uh, interesting research and testing around the very specific backup power supply systems that are available on the market to really see what works best for the needs of individuals who have these life-sustaining equipment. Um, a lot of it is used for things like camping and outdoor recreation. So they're really doing a lot of groundbreaking work doing the testing for these devices specifically for use with these types of uh, equipment that individuals in long-term services and supports might use. So really excited about this. We have devices available until we don't. So it's just kind of a first come first serve situation. So please apply. Um, we do have a timeline deadline of later this fall when the funding is no longer able to be used. So um, please share this with anybody that you know that might be interested in applying. And we'll go to the next slide. The second component of this ARPA project is emergency go kits. So working with the Center for Inclusive Design and Engineering again on this project, and an emergency go kit is a collection of essential items that you might need in the case of an emergency that you can grab and take with you quickly. Um, it, it's customized to an individual's disability. Um, so it might include, for example, a dog bowl if you have a service animal. It might include a whiteboard if you have uh, speech issues and you need to be able to communicate in the, in the instance of emergency and you don't have a more high-tech device to do so. Um, so these backpacks are assembled by the team at CIDE on a very kind of individualized level. Um, anybody can apply for this. Um, if you go to the next slide, I have some outlined criteria for this program as well. You just have to be an active member to apply for these go kits. Um, CU is also managing the application process for this. So I'll drop a link to this as well. The Surviving in Place webpage has more information, including additional trainings that are available for individual members and families for creating uh, emergency plans, as well as providers who are interested in creating emergency plans. Next slide, please. So this next grant, uh, part of our 4.07 Complex Needs Service Enhancement System of Care grant is also very exciting. Um, this has awards amounting from 5,000 to 50,000. The deadline is at the end of this month specifically. And this is really an opportunity for uh, applicants who operate an HCBS uh, approved residential setting that is owned or rented by the operating service provider agency. So things like group homes, um, one to three person staff homes for adults, uh, ACFs, supported living programs, transitional living programs, 
residential childcare facilities or group homes for children are all eligible. Um, and this provides on some funding, uh, it provides funding for expanding or enhancing this or strengthening the capacity of these service providers to serve individuals receiving HCBS with disabilities and complex behavioral support needs. Um, so we have a little bit more time for this grant. Um, I will also post the links where you can read more in detailed uh, information in that request for application document to see if it's something that you might want to apply for. Next slide. Okay, I will pause there to see if we have any questions um, about the grants, about the budget and legislative session coming up, um, case management, anything. The floor is open to anybody that might have any lingering questions. I know we have answered several in the Q&A, so if you want to review those, there might be some helpful information in there if you didn't see those questions appearing there. Um, but I will pause for another couple of seconds to see if anybody has anything. Okay, looks like we're good. So let's keep moving along, Jen, thank you. Okay, so we're getting towards the end of our webinar today. Um, a couple of kind of uh, housekeeping slides at the end. We have this Stay Engaged slide with links to all of the important ways that we communicate out to our stakeholders, including our calendar, um, our memo series pages, uh, an email address that you can send any questions that you have for the Office of Community Living, um, our ARPA website, our newsletter, and our webinar page. That's the page where the slides have been posted for this webinar, and we will post the recording in the coming days. Next slide. Um, we have another page on the website, this OCL stakeholder engagement page that highlights other ongoing engagement opportunities that are more project or topic specific. So please keep this page bookmarked if you're interested in finding out about what we're doing outside of these webinars. We also have a calendar on the top of this page that shows you the meetings with all of the uh, joining information for those meetings right here on the same site. Next page. And our satisfaction survey. As always, we are asking for your feedback about how these webinars are. Um, we started these during COVID to provide all of the important updates that were happening rapid fire, but you know they've evolved over time and we wanna make sure that they are still relevant to you. If you have suggestions about things that we might include, please send us an email um, or let us know in the survey. I just dropped that survey link in here for you to fill out. Next slide. And finally, our next webinar will be our ARPA quarterly update on February 15th, 3 to 4.30 p.m. Um, this is where we'll share more in-depth information about all of the 60 plus ARPA projects that we are implementing. So lots of relevant information to things that are ongoing within the Office of Community Living, as well as in some of our other offices within HICPUF. So, um, a good one to attend if you're interested in staying up to date with all of the exciting work that's being funded through ARPA. And I will turn it back to Bonnie to see if she has any closing remarks before we wrap up. Great. Thank you, Max. Um, again, we just really appreciate you all sharing space with us this morning and uh, appreciate your collaboration as we move what we know is some extraordinary work forward in this next coming year. Uh, there were some great questions in the Q&A um, in the interim, if there is ever any problems. So, I mean, I've read things like the escalation form didn't work for me. Um, please don't hesitate to, to reach out. We want to be helpful. Uh, we want to be partners and we certainly want to make sure that you're getting your needs met. And um, with that, I think we're going to give you the gift of time in this new year. Uh, again, uh, our sincere gratitude to you for your collaboration and uh, look forward to connecting. Have a great day.